British officials are reportedly working on a plan to assist U.S. forces in a preemptive attack on Iranian military facilities. It follows claims Washington is moving towards a policy of intervention out of fear that Tehran is developing a nuclear weapons program, something Iran has always denied. Well, for more on how this could affect the fragile power balance in the Middle East, I'm now joined by political analyst Chris Bambry. He's uh, joining us live there in London. Now, the British media, where you are, is uh, full of speculation that next week's International Atomic Energy Agency report will be a severe blow to Iran's claims its nuclear program is peaceful. Surely, then, a, a strong case for military action. Well, let's see the evidence that they provide. So far, they've not been able to provide any evidence. But I would say this, anyone reading the press uh, reports on these contingency plans being dropped by the Ministry of Defence here in London for an attack on Iran must be worrying that if Iran is not developing a nuclear missile, it will now be developing a nuclear missile, faced with the idea that the Americans, the British and the Israelis are looking to launch an unprovoked attack on Iran. And the world suddenly looks a much more dangerous place. I cannot imagine a worse alliance than these three powers. One power, America, has, is the only power in the world to have used atomic weapons. Israel has a secret illegal nuclear program which it denied for years, but we know it exists. It's the only nuclear power in the Middle, uh, Middle East. And Britain, of course, the former colonial power, provided them the means to get those nuclear weapons ye uh, all those ye years ago. These are the powers which have blood in their hand. Israel, of course, in, pa uh, in Palestine and in Lebanon, but Britain and America. Britain and America's involvement in Iran goes way back to 1953 when they combined to overthrow a democratic government. And this is still remembered. A radical government under Mossadegh, which had nationalized the oil industry, was overthrown by an MI5 CIA coup, which installed the Shah of Iran. And I think people in London and Washington have short memories about this. But there's always been that perceived threat from Iran. After all, that's the argument behind the anti-missile defense system uh, currently being proposed for uh, Europe. So surely uh, there is some threat here, and it's a credible threat. Well... Britain and America seem to redefine what threats are. I mean, for instance, we had for all those years of the Cold War, the threat was Russia. NATO is now realigning itself, building a, new, a, a missile shield, which seems to be aimed at Russia in part, but also definitely against Iran, with setting up in Turkey. And we've seen NATO intervening into the region all around Iran, Iran China's and Russia's borders. It seems to be provocative that you have this string of NATO American bases along in the Caucasus and elsewhere, threatening the interest of the these, uh, of these countries. And of course, we've also seen NATO launch a series of operations, most importantly in Afghanistan, but most recently in, uh, in uh, Libya. I am fearful that the so-called success of the Libyan operation will be followed by further humanitarian wars, like we saw in for, uh, former Yugoslavia uh, over a, a, de a, de a decade ago. And NATO is playing an aggressive role here. It's portrayed as a peacekeeper, but it's an aggressive role. And the missile defense shield is an aggressive uh, act. It's aggressive towards Russia. It's aggressive towards China and it's aggressive towards Iran. But, but why, why, isn't, think, why isn't Iran being transparent and open and allowing investigators to, uh, and inspectors to, to check the facilities? And also, of course, you mentioned Israel, the threat from Israel a little earlier. Iran's got every reason, has it not, to develop a nuclear deterrent? Well, firstly, Iran claims that it's developing a nuclear program for peaceful purposes. Personally, I'm against all nuclear weapons, but I think it's a bit rich to be let Iran to be lectured by the likes of Washington, London and Tel Aviv on nuclear weapons, when these are the people, as I said, the Americans are the only people to have used those weapons. These are the nuclear, uh, nuclear powers. And the hypocrisy it seems to be here is that these countries, the Western countries, can, uh, can have weapons which can destroy the world many, many more times over, but no one else has the right to develop this technology. Now, I would rather have no nuclear weapons, but I put the blame first and foremost on America, Britain and Israel here. And really, as I say, people in the region must have long memories, not just of the intervention in Iraq, and there was a contingency plan which Donald Rumsfeld literally took off the shelf within hours of 9-11 to present to George Bush for an attack in Iraq, but they must remember Britain and Israel's involvement in the Suez invasion of 1956. They must remember that Britain and America put the shy in power. They must remember Britain's involvement in that region all those uh, decades ago. All right, we're getting a lot of rhetoric from the West. And of course, if a strike were to take place, what would that do for President Ahmadinejad? Uh, clearly, he would be absolutely entitled for some sort of recrimination. What does that do for also his support there in Iran? 
Well, of course, I think people in the West seem to underestimate the strength of Iranian nationalism. There may be differences in house in Iran. However, there is a strong nationalist sense and a remembrance of what happened under, uh, of uh, foreign intervention into the country and how the Shah was uh, installed and maintained by Britain and Fran uh, America. And say that. People have long memories of the Shah and the way it's presented now in the West as if the Shah is a liberal regime. There will be a bloody war if there is an attack in Iran. Iran is not Iraq as of 2000. There will be retaliation from Hezbollah and from Hamas, and the world is a da more dangerous and place because of these reports. Chris, just finally, you talk about a bloody war and the consequences after Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya, as well as, of course, talk of intervention in Syria. Uh, is there really any appetite among the people, let alone the politicians, for further military interventions like that? Well, it seems bizarre that you would have thought that anyone even thinking about contingency plans around would look at that in the opposition in this country, Britain, for instance, to the war in Libya. There was a majority against that. But of course, we're talking about economically declining powers in America and Britain. And the military assets remain. They remain the one thing they can deploy. And we know that Britain and America, more importantly, America, are prepared to use their econ uh, military power to try and buttress their economic position in the world in relation to China, in relation to econ economy. So I think what we're seeing here, and we know this from history, economic instability often leads to military adventures, often leads to wars, and I think we must be worried at the moment. The one thing I would say is if I was an American president, I'd be worried about thinking about any attack in Iran, given the level of opposition to his economic policies we're seeing on the streets of Oakland, the streets of Washington and New York, and elsewhere with this Occupy movement. And of course the forthcoming presidential elections in November, within a year from now, so uh, interesting political gamble that would be. Chris, we could talk more, but thank you very much indeed for joining us. Chris Bambri, political analyst joining us there in London. Thanks for your time.